You're listening to the Mind Over Finger podcast, episode number 55. Welcome to the Mind Over Finger podcast, discussions on mindful music making, efficient practice, and building a purposeful career. And now your host, Dr. Renee Paul Gauthier. Hi, everyone. Today, I'm so excited to bring you violinist Elizabeth Fadley. Elizabeth is a highly sought-after pedagogue who's been hailed as an amazing, inspiring teacher by the New York Times. She's the recipient of the American String Teachers Association 2011 Studio Teacher of the Year Award for the state of New Jersey, and she's received a multitude of other teaching awards. In addition to being on the faculty of the pre-college division of the Manhattan School of Music, she has a large private studio in a New York City metropolitan area where she teaches violin performance to aspiring players from age 3 to 23. Her students have won national and international competitions and have performed in such great halls as Carnegie Hall, Alice Tolley Hall, American Concert Hall, and the White House. They're routinely accepted with scholarships to the world's premier music conservatories, including the Manhattan School of Music, the New England Conservatory, the Juilliard School, Peabody Conservatory, Rice University, Royal College of Music, and the Cleveland Institute, and they perform regularly with orchestras around the New York City area. I first came in contact with Elizabeth through a wonderful online event that I participated in last summer, the Strings Virtual Summit hosted by Alyssa Tung, which presented 30 string specialists in a variety of topics over five days. And by the way, if you didn't catch it last summer, it's not too late, and I strongly encourage you to check it out. All access passes can still be purchased, and you get a gold mine of content about string playing, practicing, teaching, health, entrepreneurship, or building your career in music. I'll put a link in the show notes, and I hope you check it out. There's so much value in these videos. So in her presentation at the summit, Elizabeth talked about teaching to encourage and inspire and how to set up your private students up for success. And her energy and enthusiasm were palpable and so inspiring. So when she announced a few months ago that she was putting together a symposium about violent pedagogy, I had to check it out. And it really got me thinking because let me tell you, it's a wonderful lineup of impactful topics with incredible clinicians. So I wanted her to come on the podcast for two reasons. First of all, I wanted you to get to know her because her approach to pedagogy and her philosophy about teaching are so inspiring and they get results because of all the care she brings to her craft. And I wanted her to talk about the symposium, which I'm going to for sure, because the topics she chose are so important in music education and they're topics that all of us musicians, students and teachers must think about. And even if your instrument is on the violin, it's easy to map the principles you'll hear about onto the specifics of your own instrument. It's really my hope with this episode that it will inspire you to think about all the different aspects of music making that you can look into more deeply or that maybe you need to brush up on, either for your own playing or to benefit your students. And I hope it might even inspire you to create opportunities for more discussions on these topics in your community or maybe even put together your own symposium in the future. So get ready for a massive dose of inspiration and also a lot of great applicable tips. Let's go to the show. Elizabeth Fadley, so great to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. This is amazing. Elizabeth, you're a violin teacher with an extremely dynamic studio, and I got to know more about you through your wonderful presentation last summer at the Strings Virtual Summit hosted by Alyssa Tong, for which we were both speakers. And for those of you who don't know what the Virtual Summit is, you can go check it out, and I think the videos can still be accessed. I'll put a link in the show note 
Um, but before we get into the topics that I wanted to talk about today, please tell us a little bit about yourself, about your musical journey, and how you got to where you are today. My musical journey began like everyone else's as just a young violinist studying and practicing really hard. I grew up in Tennessee and um, there weren't quite as many opportunities there as there are here in New York City where I currently am. But I practiced hard and I worked hard and I knew it was what I wanted to do. And when um, I was about 16 or 17, I got my first students actually who were just some neighborhood kids and they were interested in playing as well. So I began teaching them and I think I was probably very, very bad. So sorry, Sarah and Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they're doing okay. From there, I uh, continued on to Peabody Conservatory. Um, where I studied with a few of my mentors, including uh, Shirley Givens, Rebecca Henry, and Ching Lee. And um, I became the assistant to the uh, Peabody Preparatory Department right away and was the assistant to the director of the Young People's Dream Program. So I gained tons of experience there. And it was then that I learned that this was this was my place. This is what I am meant to do. So I didn't, I still practiced a thousand hours a day and was still pursuing violin at a very high level and practicing my Brahms concerto. But it was at that time that I realized and looked around and thought to myself, wow, there are a lot of people who play Brahms as well as I do, but I really think I have a special connection with students and families. And I love mentoring them um, even past after they graduate. So when I got offered the position at Manhattan School of Music in the pre-college, I moved to New York City. And that was 13 or 14 years ago. And then from there, the teaching has mostly exploded. And now I have a private studio with about 60 students. And then I have, I also teach at Manhattan School in the pre-college. And I also have developed an associate teacher program where I have seven or eight teachers who are under my guidance. And they And I co-teach many students together and I sort of lead their teaching and provide all kinds of opportunities for their students. So I guess that, that's where I am today, just very busy teaching a thousand people. <laughs> I think it's so inspiring to see how you were smart enough or aware enough, I should say, maybe to really look into the situation and you were able to recognize your own special ability and really forge your own path. I think that It's something that so many people sometimes fail to really look hard at what's going on. You know what I mean? I, yes, I agree. I, I think that I was very lucky or fortunate to have that foresight pretty early on at a young age of like 20 or 21 because I, um, of course, the performing is, is important, but I did realize that there were just a lot of people as good as I was, but I really felt very special teaching. And I felt, um, just, I felt so wonderful when my kids would go on stage and play either Twinkle or Mozart three or Mendelssohn. And it, I got such a bigger feedback from that and more powerful feedback from that than I did performing or playing big orchestras or, or performing with regional orchestras or whatever it was. So I felt like it was what I was sort of meant to do. And so I just followed it. Mm. And that's probably why the studio is so successful. I see that your students are very dedicated. They seem to be extremely well guided by you. And that probably stems all from what you're talking about, this, this feeling that you have when you teach and, you know, this passion that you have for it. Thank you. Um, yes, the students, my students are all extremely dedicated. And of course, you know, my studio has grown over the years. Um, you know, I right now I only have a few little ones. I have mostly teenagers and it, it has really blossomed into bringing in the most dedicated families. I have students who come from Florida, Ohio, Maryland, California, Um, Indiana, kind of all over the country now, because they're attracted to the kind of nurturing studio that I offer. So I'm I'm really really proud of of the studio family that I've created, the friendships among the kids and the parents, and the the desire that the that the students have to work hard. Elizabeth, a few months ago, you announced that you were putting together a 
pedagogy symposium. So I went online and I checked it out and it only took me a few seconds to know that I really wanted to be there. And the more I was looking at the topics that are going to be discussed, the more I wanted the two of us to talk about it because I feel like it really presents music education as a holistic thing. And there's so many aspects that we need to pay attention to when we learn an instrument. So I wanted us to discuss that today. But before, can we go back to what we were just talking about with, which is your teaching pedagogy and and what you think is essential to the development of the young musicians? Absolutely. So right from the beginning, my pedagogy is very, very focused on foundational technique. That's what I call it. So a lot of people throw around the word technique, but for me, the foundational technique is what everyone needs to have a strong start. So when the kids start um, with me or with one of my teachers, we start with very, very uh, clear basics, a beautiful bow hold, beautiful posture and, a, and straight bows. You know, our very first piece has, is about straight bows and opening the elbow. And then we go into left hand frame. So I sort of really, really before twinkle, they're already playing with a really strong foundational technique as they grow. I continue to have an emphasis on the foundational technique uh, while adding other things, of course, vibrato and shifting technique and all the bow techniques, but I'm continuously going back to that foundational technique. And one thing I think is interesting is I have tons of master classes for my kids. Just this weekend alone, we had Carolyn Widman from Germany and Rachel Barton Pine. Mm. In the past, we've had Sarah Chang, Ray Chin, Stefan Jakiv, and uh, Augustine Hadalit. And one thing that they pretty much all say in common is they're also well set up. They're also well prepared. And I think that that initial setup is so important so that they're comfortable and that they are ready to make music and and focus on expression. So that is one thing in the symposium that I will be um, talking. It's like the first um, topic of the of the first day is technique from the ground up and how to teach the foundational technique at different stages, both when you have a new student and when you have a student who might be restarting. Mm-hmm. And that's so important because sometimes with older students. There's so much remedial work that's needed. It really slows down the progress. So to really start with what you're talking about, this approach of having very clear basics. I love that. I call it resetting a violinist who is new to you. Oh, <laughs> I love that. That is my terminology for the remedial. But it's it's very, very difficult uh, because they've come and they might be 15 and they want to go to music school and everything is a huge mess. And you're like, where do I begin? And so this will give you, this is where I begin. This is what I do. And it's been very, very successful with a lot of a lot of students who are now really flourishing a year later. Mm. Yes. And I love the terms that you're using. You just said flourishing. You talked about nurturing earlier. You mentioned that you had a studio family. This seems to be a very important part of your teaching, this this caring. It is. It is a really important part of my teaching. I actually find that the more nurturing my studio is, the harder the the students try and the more dedicated the families are. Mm. So I have had an interesting kind of phenomena happen where all of my students think they are my favorite student. <laughs> and that really is my goal because I don't want them to think that I have a star or a special student. I want every single one to feel like I'm her favorite. Like Elizabeth loves me. So that's kind of my goal. The other, the other um, really useful thing that I also plan to talk about at this symposium is my idea of what I call a 24 seven teacher. And this is not for everybody. This is for teachers who, this is for musicians who have dedicated their career to teaching. But basically I do not really believe that the one hour or even a two hour a week lesson mold fits every student and family. Mm. So I have a an open door policy where I have a separate cell phone actually for my students. And 
they are allowed and encouraged to text me all the time, to send me videos, to you know, um, to ask me questions, to send parts of pieces they don't understand. And what I do is I spend an hour to three hours every day, every morning going through and I answer their questions, their parents' questions. I send back videos explaining something like if a new student sends me a video of a martelet exercise and she's just not quite getting the initial click of the martelet, I'll do a video for her and I'll send it back. And I find that if you're involved in that way, then they give it back to you. So that's mostly what I mean by nurturing. I'm also I'm also not a yeller. I'm very, very tough on my students and I have high expectations, but I do it in a way that is supportive. So I do not believe in being degrading or mean or yelling or anything like that. I have had a few parents who come to the studio and say, you have to yell at her. She's not practicing enough. And then I say, you have to let me work. Like you have to let me get to know her and find out what appeals to her, set up a plan that works for her mind because they're all different. And then if that parent doesn't agree with my uh, idea of getting to know the student over a month or so, then they don't stay in the studio Mm -hmm. just simply because I'm not going to yell. I do not believe in making the students feel the world is, is hard enough and it's hard enough being a young person today. So I do not believe in making them feel shame or degrading them in any way. So in my studio, very high expectations and I'm very kind of, I'm very tough. I think they would all say, but I'm, I, we hug a lot and we talk about everything that's wonderful. And I think they probably would all tell you that they are my favorite. (laughs) Mm. Oh, that's wonderful. And I think it's so important to treat students that way and really foster this inner motivation in them this way. And I, it really sounds like what you are doing there is growing a love of music and a sense of community that creates such a special relationship with music for those students. I think it's so inspiring. Oh, thank you. I I hope so. That's, that's my goal. Nice. Now this might sound a little bit like a publicity for the symposium, although it's not, but I really want to hear more about it. And I hope that people check it out. It's very oriented towards violinists, I believe, but I love the way you built it, the way you organized it, the topics that you are approaching and also the guests that you have. So I would like to talk about it a little bit. And the reason I wanted to to talk about this is because, as I mentioned earlier, it's so difficult sometimes to figure out all of the aspects that we need to bring to our students. And it's a holistic experience to learn to play the violin or any other instrument. So talk to us a little bit about maybe what motivated uh, this symposium and these topics and the guests that you picked and why you think it's important to cover these topics and why you chose specific guests. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you for asking. So I have been to the Suzuki um, conference uh, that happens um Every other year, I've been to ASTA. I've presented at ASTA. I've been to the Juilliard Starling Symposium. So those are probably our three biggest ones that we have right now. And um, at the Suzuki conference, I feel like it's just so directed in Suzuki, which of course it should be, so that there there's there are different aspects missing. And at ASTA, they um they, the, the the topics are, are so spread out and it covers like everything, even like bands and things. And so I feel like it's kind of hard to narrow down exactly what you want to learn about. And at the Juilliard Symposium, you are learning in depth about, um, one or two topics. And then you are going and listening to very, very talented, Um, high school students, but I feel, and the master classes that are presented are at a very, very high level. So what I felt from each of those three experiences was that they're all worthwhile and amazing, but they're kind of all missing exactly what the teachers are looking for, which is which is training or brushing up or different perspectives on exactly what we do every day. 
So my symposium was born um, from those ideas, from the idea that, hey, I need to make a symposium for just violinists where we're going over, we're learning from different artists exactly what we need to put into our own teaching daily and get new ideas, that kind of thing. So that's that's where the idea came from. And then um, it just sort of spiraled from there. I My Instagram <clears throat> at Fadley Studio is a really big platform currently. I share mostly videos of my students, sometimes clips of lessons or pedagogy clips. And I get so many questions. And one time um, during the summer, right before this, uh, I did a Q&A and it was like, ask Elizabeth anything about pedagogy. And I think, I think I had about 600 questions in under 45 minutes. Wow. And they were all about teaching technique, order of repertoire, um, uh, how to run a studio, literally just like all from all over the world and just sort of like come and you could tell that people are just really wanting to know, wanting this to soak up this information and a lot of repeated questions. So I actually printed them all out and using that information is how I built the symposium. Wow. The other thing I did was I took a survey. I got a whole bunch of email addresses from Instagram, from people I know, from famous musicians, everything. And I sent around a Google survey and it had topics. And I asked people to rate how much they wanted to learn about each topic. And that is how I chose the topics was just based strictly on which topics got the most, um, got the most votes. So I'm really trying to bring exactly what people are asking for to the symposium. Mm, I love that. It's really built around the needs of the community and tailored to what people are hungry for. That is exactly what I am attempting to do. Exactly that. Give them what they want. Yes. And that's probably why looking at it for, you know, I just hopped on the page when you talked about it. By the way, going back to your Instagram page, um, I'll put the link in the show note, but it's so great. And it really displays what you were talking about, this nurturing, because all the students look like they're having so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Instagram is fun. I get to show different sides, different personalities, different students, and they all love being featured on it. And I think you can tell that the students are having fun and they're all smiling and they're all working hard. And that's sort of, you know, that's what I'm all about. And in my stories, you can see kind of what happens in the backstage and you can see funny clips and things like that, because we do have a lot of fun and we do laugh. And so I think it's important that when, the, when you're studying something as hard as you are violent, I mean, I have 14 year olds practicing four hours a day on Tchaikovsky concerto. So these kids need to laugh and have fun and jump around and be silly. Mm. So I think that I love showing that in the stories and I think people in, enjoy seeing that too. And I think that what you just explained, this targeting of people's needs, the questions that they have is probably why when I hopped on the website, I was looking at it and thought, wow, I really want to go to this. So, and, and I'm I'm kind of a symposium or conference geek. I love um, ASTA and yeah, unfortunately my performance schedule keeps me away from most of them, but the Violin Pedagogy Symposium is at the end of August, which is perfect for me. So, I also did a survey on dates and this and August 20th was like the date that seemed to work for most people. I really tried to tailor it to literally like I took so much information and data and really tried to make it work for as many people as possible. Mm. So tell us more about it. Well, um, one thing I do want to mention about it before I talk about the topics or the guest speakers is that unlike the other symposiums, which are again, really, really great. I am keeping it very small. I think it's going to be around 60 to 70 people total, which if you compare that to Suzuki or Asta is teeny. Uh, my plan is for all of us to know each other. This is not some kind of, you know, money business thing I'm doing. This is more of a more of a, a giving a, a collection of ideas and a coming together of teachers. And I did not want it to grow so much that it's not an intimate experience. So I want everyone at the conference to know each other by the end. And I want everyone to feel comfortable 
emailing me. I want everyone to feel comfortable coming up and talking to me or approaching our guests. I want it to be sort of like a, a weekend where we're all together and just talking violin all the time. And so that's why I'm keeping it very, very small. So the topics uh, that are included are topics that are really important to me. So I'll start with the topics I'm doing, and then I'll move over and talk about my guest artists, which are the ones I'm frankly really excited about. Um, but I am going to be talking about technique from the ground up, where I basically show exactly how I reset a violinist or start a violinist. So this includes everything from bow holds to pinky houses, which I get so many questions about, to teaching weight distribution, to teaching posture, to teaching everything from the very beginning. I will also discuss communication with parents at every single stage. The other things I'm talking about are repertoire-related Growing from Vivaldi to Mozart, I get so many questions about repertoire sequencing. Mm. Three of my symposium topics are actually based on repertoire sequencing and the technique that goes along with that. So I have one that's Vivaldi, a minor, to Mozart. I have one that's Mozart to Brook, and I have one that's called Flying from Brook to Sibelius, because I get so many questions about how do you link pieces, what is the right order, and I'm not going to say that my order is correct, and I will explain that I actually don't have a set order. I sort of decide some things based on um, the child's strengths and weaknesses, but um, I also go over all the techniques, what I do before the piece, and that sort of thing. I find that this is an area that pedagogy classes or Suzuki training or other training has really missed. And so a lot of teachers have questions about successful students. How did Chelsea get to be playing the Sibelius? What did she play before this? What did the last six years of her life look like? So that's what I want to show in in those lectures. Mm. I will also be talking about other techniques vibrato, shifting, advanced bow techniques, um, how to teach, how I teach spagato, how I teach vibrato. Um, how do you align bow techniques with repertoire and when do you teach them separately and when do you teach them together? So that is a class that I'm excited about. And another one that I'm running is called the politics of running a studio, which is something else I get asked about all the time. And I think I'm going to do it mostly in a Q and a format. But I will answer any questions that anyone has, but I will talk about everything from um, how to gain students mm. to how to create special opportunities, how to retain students, how to communicate with families, um, dealing with families and schools, that kind of thing. So I think that there's a lot of a lot of work that goes into running a studio. And um, I feel like I kind of I'm really good at that aspect of it, the people side. So I want to share all of my experience and my knowledge and sort of help other teachers retain and, and gain students in and, and that way. You know, I really love that because we saw in your story how you went to teaching out of, of passion and feeling a real pull towards it. But so many teachers fall into teaching as um, an alternative or to fill in some hours or supplement income. And, and some people might not have the structure needed to build a studio. And I think that that curriculum is so thoughtfully planned. And even for people that have a very thorough approach to teaching, it seems that it would really help to freshen things up and, you know, renew the enthusiasm for teaching and give so many new ideas. Yes, absolutely. And at these uh, lectures also, I'm going to encourage conversation. I want others to stand up and, you know, raise their hand and be like, you know, I always just really felt like I teach Mendelssohn from the third movement. And then we'll discuss. So I want it to be discussion. I want it to be involved. It's not like me just like yapping for like an hour. I want everyone to be involved and in sharing ideas because everyone has something to bring to the table. So I want to hear it. And so that's what it's about me learning also. Mm, wow. Okay. Tell us about the speakers. Okay. So I have no idea how this happened actually, but I have got the most amazing lineup of speakers. And I'm, I'm just so, so excited that they're excited and that they 
jumped on board with me. It was sort of a, like it, it happened so fast and it was so special. And I felt so excited for the symposium. So the first speaker is Rachel Barton Pine, who is um, just a queen. And she's, <laughs> she, our master class with her was incredible. She is a genius. She is so smart and she really explains things in a beautiful, succinct way. And of course, she's Rachel Barton Pine. So she's also, you know, a Paganini goddess and everything. So I feel like just coming to the whole symposium to hear her talk would be worth it. At the te- at the symposium, she will be discussing Bach, the preparation for learning unaccompanied Bach, techniques you need, the varying interpretations, and a little and some tips on teaching it. And she will also be doing a Q and A at the symposium. Mm. Oh, and she wants you to bring your violin. So everyone will be playing for Rachel Barton Pine. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sounds wonderful. Don't be scared. <laughs> Um, the next one is with one of my favorite people, Dr. Noah Kagayama. He's the author of the blog Bulletproof Musician. Um, you should all subscribe to it. It's incredible. I read it every week. And I've had him come for master classes several times. He's going to be presenting on beating anxiety and performing under pressure, which is what he specializes in. So it's sort of like a sports psychologist, but a music psychologist. Mm-hmm. And in the past, he has come and taught us a lot about this. So we're I'm really excited to have him back. He's very calm and presents information in a very clear and concise manner too. So he is he's this is what he does. And um he's just in general just a just a really fantastic source of information. And he's gonna be teaching teachers how to teach students. So he's gonna be he's going to be angling his conversation towards you're the teachers. Now here's how you help your students instead of the other. So I think it'll be a very interesting perspective. Mm, Sounds amazing. I'm going to have um, the fantastic Ed Kreitman who is in Chicago and he's one of my favorite Suzuki trainers. I love him. He's so energetic and joyful about what he does. And he's going to be taking us from Twinkle to Vivaldi A minor. And um, he's sort of the jump off for the sequencing, but he's going to go through all of them very quickly and what technique is taught when, how fast should you go? I immediately asked Ed as soon as I, I wanted someone else to teach this lecture and um, he'll be doing it from a Suzuki slant, but also with some other um, ideas of his own as well and bringing in some of the, the books that he has written. So I am really, really excited to see Ed. Um, Another one is uh, the hilarious and amazing Taylor Morris, who is coming to do, he's going to do one of our night sessions. So we're all going to party as violinists do. And we're all going to bring our violins and we're going to learn about improv and fiddling and how it can enrich our teaching of even classical music. So, and this is an area where I feel is my weakest as a teacher. I am, I never, like I, I never improvised myself. I never fiddled, even though I'm from Tennessee, much to my father's um, upset. And Taylor is going to be teaching us the value of improvisation, the value of fiddling and how to incorporate it at all levels. And we're going to play. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the next one is with social media expert, Ryan Walker, who's located in LA. Ryan is with TSMA Consulting and he is a fantastic resource for everything social media related. He is a social media genius. He's helped with Disney, Nickelodeon. He runs all kinds of um, celebrity Instagrams and campaigns. And he is going to be talking about how to use social media to strengthen your studio, to show your students what you should do, what you should not do, the differences in in the different social media. Social media is huge these days. I'm on a podcast right now. Mm. Um, Technology and social media are really, really important. And um, the whole symposium was born out of, really out of Instagram. So I really, I invited Ryan to come as, as more of a, like a, for, I'm, I can't wait to learn from him, but he's going to teach us why it's important, what we should do, um, how to get followers, how to spread the word about your business um, and your studio and that kind of thing. So I'm really excited to have Ryan. Wow. The next guest is Amy Beth Horman, who is a teacher at San Francisco Conservatory. 
She's also the mom of a young uh, violinist, Ava, and she and I sort of are walking similar paths. So we're very good friends and colleagues. And of, I think most people know that I have a daughter, Ellie, who is a, a budding cellist. And um, Amy's daughter is a violinist. And we, we find ourselves kind of at the same crossroads a lot and sort of dealing with the same issues and dealing with daughters who are the same age. And one of her topics is um, a point of view. She's from the teacher, a violin mom, and practicing. So we have an interesting point of view in that we have seen what practicing is like. And I have to say, my advice to parents on practicing changed so drastically after Ellie turned eight or nine and we really got into it. And she got very serious around that time. And And the same thing happened with Amy Beth. And basically you get a whole other perspective that you otherwise wouldn't have unless you have this child at home. So I think Mm -hmm. that her her speaking about this is going to be an invaluable resource because we've seen the other side now, the dark side, and we understand it. And now my advice to parents, it's so much more empathetic and sympathetic and has, I have a lot more useful things to offer than thinking, why can't you just practice with your child an hour and a half a day? Like, I don't understand. Just like Mark, make the time. Like before I was naive and now I'm like, Oh, trust me. I understand. Here are some Mm -hmm. things. So I think Amy Beth is very, very clear and succinct. And she's going to be talking about that. She's also going to be giving um, a very popular symposium topic. I think it might've gotten the most votes, which is called Etude University. Mm. That's my name. It's adorable. (laughs) <laughs> and um, she, uh, she's going to be going through a systematic approach to etudes, um, starting with maybe Wolfhard and moving into, you know, when does she teach sit? When does she teach Kreutzer? What happens after that? And so I'm really, really excited about that one as well. And we will be providing um, handouts and I haven't decided if they're going to be electronic or not. I'm still sort of dealing with the logistics of it, but she'll have a whole packet about, um, about the etudes and her, what she teaches through A2s. And she has run a very successful studio from Washington, D.C. before moving to San Francisco. So Amy Beth will lead both of those, and I'm really excited about them. And you know, Amy Beth was the guest of episode 19 of the Mind Over Finger podcast, and she was talking about that approach to performing. And of course, I've been following her Instagram account for so long. And and I agree with you because I'm the mom of uh, two young pianists. So I, I agree with how the perspective on teaching young musician changes when you become a mother. That's for sure. But yeah, and I'm very excited about Etude University <laughs> because it's so difficult to convince students to practice etudes. And now that things are so busy. I wish I could practice etudes all the time. I love them so much now. <laughs> yes. And I, one time at Asta, um, my, my colleague, Ryan Caparella, um, who will be at the symposium and I did a presentation called the mini etude, which is something that is, I, I kind of created about 15 years ago. So I'll probably pop into her lecture and talk a little bit about, if she doesn't mind a little bit about about my approach to etudes, which is slightly different than other people, or I might include it at another time. But one thing that I think I do with etudes that's been especially useful is that I present etudes in small doses. So we don't Mm -hmm. play an entire Kreutzer. I will give them four lines and that's it. And we Mm -hmm. focus on, you know, or we will do etudes that aren't in a book. We'll do something just for vibrato. You'll see a lot of that on my Instagram or something just for the bow hand. So I find that if you deal them, get, if you deal them out in small doses, the students are not overwhelmed and they're much more willing. So if you say, Hey, Adriana, you're only going to play this for four minutes, but you're going to do it twice. That's really a chunk that uh, an 11 year old can understand. Yeah. I love that. Any other speakers you want to tell us about? Um, I think, Uh, There's two lectures or three lectures left. Um, My brilliant pianist, Michael Wittenberg, who you've all seen on my Instagram, he's uh, he's a studio coach and conductor of my orchestra and all around genius. 
he will be presenting a lecture um, on how to train your accompanist or your collaborative pianist. And we don't mean that in any derogatory way, but it's just a kind of cute title we're working with. And that lecture will talk about the difference between accompanying a in book one and the difference between transitioning to the student becoming the leader and the difference mm-hmm. between when you should lead, when you should follow, and some of his techniques and ways that he's come up with to coach students and play with pianists and orchestras. So that will be a really fascinating one. And he'll also do a Q&A. Mm-hmm. Another, um, another topic I'm going to do is about conservatory auditions and um I'm working on the speaker for this one currently, but what are committees looking for in a pre-screen? Um, what pieces should you choose? Should you go with an easier piece and have it be totally comfortable and they've played it for four years or should you show what they can do? Um, is there a preferred Bach? What are the secrets? That kind of thing. So that's going to be there for the students who want to go to music school and the teachers who teach them. And then I think probably um, one of my favorite uh, pedagogy discussions is going to be with the psychologist who's coming. And she's a child and family psychologist. And she is going to be helping us. She's worked with gifted children and she's worked with special needs children. So she's going to be giving us her point of view on the psychology behind children, teenagers, and family dynamics, which Everybody who's taught knows that family dynamics really come into the studio in a large way every single time. So she's going to discuss how to handle pushy parents, parents who don't help enough, both sides of it. She'll talk about tiger parents. She'll talk about parents who need to be more tigerish. She's going to talk about special needs and how you can teach every single student, how you can understand what they need better. And she is going to talk about the shift when children grow into teenagers and before they go to college, because at various stages in their life, students require different nurturing and different teaching. So she's going to be going over that, which I think is just absolutely invaluable. Wow. That's really incredible. I I will... First of all, that's an all-star lineup right there. And I love the terms you're using to describe them. Joyful, hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like it's going to be a very vibrant event. And I'm really excited about it. Thank and you. there's, you know, it's going to be such a big dose of knowledge and inspiration. And all of these topics that you're covering really shows that teaching is such a multidimensional thing. You know, you don't just have a student come in and you teach a few techniques. It, you're really showing how we have to put some thought into meeting the students where they are, address their concerns, address their needs, um, put some thoughts and effort into what you were talking about, the repertoire sequencing, how to approach etudes. And I don't know, I, I think that People who are listening to this that play other instruments, that it could be maybe an inspiration for them on how to approach building a symposium for the instrument. Absolutely. I, you're absolutely right. I've actually had many cello teachers contact me and a few of them are coming and I think that's fantastic. So the symposium, although there will be many topics that are of course violin centric, I do have a few cellists coming and I think one pianist and I think that they are coming not to learn about our, our sequencing of repertoire but everything else, the the Noah Kageyama and Taylor Morris and the psychologist and how to get in conservatory. So I think they're coming to learn, you know, all these other aspects and to be around this kind of training. So I invite other instruments to come, you know, I am also inviting parents to come. If you have a child and you want to learn all of this stuff from the teacher perspective, parents are invited, come and learn. I think it's so much value you're bringing to the musical community. I'm so excited about it. Thank you so much. I'm excited too. And I would also encourage everyone um, who has questions to just reach out to me. I answer all of my um, Instagram direct messages myself. And so I will definitely respond to you. So please, if you have any questions about it, let me know. It's going to be at the beautiful Weston Hotel in Times Square. And Mm. you don't have to stay there, but they are giving a special rate. And it's really reasonable for New York City Times Square in the summer. 
And I would suggest coming a few days early or staying a few days and enjoying New York City and go to a show and go to the Met Museum and just sort of, you know, enjoy it like a mini vacation. And um, the Westin is a wonderful hotel. It's gorgeous. I hand selected it after going through about 12 or 13 options. And all of our, all of our um, topics will be, all of our lectures will be on the, in that hotel. So if you're staying there, we'll just make it um, easier. And um, we'll all be hanging out, eating together, having lunch. It'll be, it'll be really awesome. Before we jump in the rapid fire question segment, tell us where we can find all of the information and I'll put it in the show notes as well. Oh, great. So pedagogysymposium.com. That is the official where you can learn about everything about it. And um, I also have a hashtag violin pedagogy symposium running on Instagram. And you can also just ask me anything. And I think maybe after um, your podcast comes out, I'll do another Ask Elizabeth Anything. So maybe this um, on Friday today, I'll, I'll have one of those. Oh, that sounds great. Well, I could keep talking with you all day and I cannot <laughs> wait for the symposium in August. But how about a round of rapid fire questions? Sure. Go for it. What's your favorite tool in the practice room and why? My phone. Oh. <laughs> I know, I know. It's not a good answer, but I'm being honest because it's rapid fire and not Elizabeth slowly talks forever. So <laughs> because my phone has a metronome, a camera where I can record myself and it has the voice memos where I can do a uh, recordings for my students or they can record themselves or we record Michael playing the accompaniment and they practice with it at home. Um, so I find it has tuners. It has everything these days. So I have to say, because it's so easy and everybody has it, sadly, that is my favorite. Correct. I know. I am so on board with you. Everything you mention. Oh, wait. Did I mention the metronome? That's the most important. Metronome. Metronome. I have nine metronomes on my phone. You do? Oh, my gosh. That's <laughs> impressive. I have Tunable, which I love and use for everything. I absolutely love Tunable. Yep. And I love Modacity as well. Do you know about Modacity? No, I'm going to have to download it immediately. Yes. Well, there's an episode about it. I forget which number, maybe episode four or five of the podcast where I was talking with Mark Gelfo, which was the founder of the Medacity app. It's a mindful practice app. It's fantastic. Wow. And we did um, on my Facebook group, the the tribe, we did a practice challenge last spring. It was great. So the Medacity app is really great. But I agree with you. All my students are downloading it immediately as well. <laughs> Sounds great. I'll put a link in the show notes for that, actually. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. It's a little bit like we said, this is never really rapid fire question. It's like a slow roasting. <laughs> 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 Do you have a favorite book that you would recommend to our listeners? I like The Inner Game of Tennis. Mm. Um, I also like all of the books like that are directed towards parents by Ed Kreitman and Ed Sprunger. I think any book like that is good. And Inner Game of Tennis is really good for teenagers to read about um, how to settle your mind and relax and uh, focus on your performance. Yeah, such a great book. What skills do you think young musicians studying today should acquire in addition to learning to play their instruments? They need to acquire grit. I don't know if that's a skill or more of a characteristic that we need to grow, but grit is the most important characteristic or personality trait that you need to grow as a young person. You need grit for all areas of your life, whether you go to music school and become a violinist or a cellist, or you go and become a doctor or, or, or a pharmacist or, or whatever you become, a grit or a mom Grit is is literally the ability to deal and be resilient. And I think one of the reasons I've been successful is my grit and I'm trying to pass it on to my daughter. Grit is grit can help you in every single way. You've just got to work hard, keep your goal in mind. You've got to be able to get over things that life has hills and valleys and grit um, can help mm. you with that. And you know, I think music is a great way to develop grit in all aspects of your life, learning to play an instrument. I agree. They're stronger, smarter, stronger. It's it's really amazing, these, these students that I get to work with. You said that grit contributed to your success and that was going to be my next question. The habit that you have that you think has contributed to your success? Uh, definitely my grit, but I would also say just genuine hard work, just literal hours of time spent 
planning for every student, working as hard as I can to incorporate all of the things that I'm talking about for every single student. Sort of, this is again controversial, but I obsessively work hard for my entire studio. So that is, I would say that is my habit that sometimes I work too hard and I, I get exhausted and my voice sounds like this, but I think that that the hard work and the grit are really, really important if you love what you do and you want to do it to the best of your ability. And that goes across, of course, the entire spectrum of the world. Mm, I really love that. And, you know, going back to the book that you mentioned earlier, I love that you mentioned the inner game of tennis because in the tribe, uh, I'm going to start a book club starting in January 2020, oh. and we're going to cover the inner game of golf. And the reason I picked the inner game of golf is because Nathan Cole in his episode mentioned that this was the book that really opened his awareness to different ways to approach practicing. And, you know, Timothy Galway is a tennis pro, but he was a golf amateur. So his approach to the inner game of golf is... I feel like a little bit more systematic and uh, it's explained very clearly. So if anyone wants to hop in the tribe on Facebook, we're going to have this uh, as a book club choice for January. That's amazing. My other favorite book um, uh, besides the musical ones is called Mindset, mm. The New Psychology of Success. It's about development of grit and it's by Carol Dweck. And it's one of my favorite books. It's about parenting, business, school, relationships. And it's, 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 one, of my, it's one of my favorite all-time books. Oh, that's great. I'll link both these books in uh, the resource page on my website. And actually, if I look up left, I see Mindset by Carol Dweck on my shelf. Oh, <laughs> that's a great book. It's, it's wonderful. I've read it like three times. It's I just find her to be a wonderful writer. And also, she hits on so many things that I'm attempting to nurture within my students and my daughter all the time. In conclusion, how about a quick actionable tip that listeners can implement today in their musical lives? Work in chunks. Make sure that you're practicing slowly enough to never miss anything before you speed it up. And triage. Mm. So if you go to the hospital and you have a pinky toe injury and somebody else comes in and they have a heart attack, the heart attack is going to get treated first, hopefully. <laughs> so this is something that I talk about a lot with my students, and which is musical triaging. So If you're playing Mendelssohn and you're worried about phrasing and you're worried about the ricochet stroke and you're worried about blah, 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 but it's totally out of tune and the rhythm is all whack, then you have not triaged correctly and your heart attack has died and the pinky toe is getting a Band-Aid. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of that and I really, really wish that I think teachers triage, I hope, but the students need to triage within practicing. That's a fantastic tip. Speaking with you, I feel very motivated and I very much look forward to this symposium, but I feel like in addition to this, your approach to teaching, the way you speak of your love of teaching, your love of your students and how much care and thought you put into putting this event together, I find it extremely motivating and inspiring. And I'm just, I'm so happy we had this opportunity to talk today. Thank you so much. That is so that you've really hit on what I attempt to do. So it's it's so gratifying and wonderful to hear that it's it's actually coming through. That's amazing. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And I'll put all the links for the symposium in the show notes. And I hope that we'll see some of the listeners there. Yeah, and just really, I am open. I am here. Ask me anything. Thank you guys so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed this chat with Elizabeth Fadley. I don't know about you, but I feel like she's the teacher we all wish we had had at some point in our journey. And I think all of us teachers aspire to be like her, to get this kind of connection with our students, to create a wonderful studio vibe and have vibrant, dedicated students that we can impact in such a positive way. I cannot wait for the symposium, and I really hope I'll see some of you there. You can find all the info about it at pedagogysymposium.com. 
pedagogysymposium.com. That's easy enough to remember. And I'll put the link in the show notes as well as all the info to learn more about Elizabeth. In the meantime, you can also check out the Strings Virtual Summit at strings with an S, virtualsummit.com. And I'll put a link in the show notes to get you a really great deal on all the video lectures and all the transcripts. I'm also really excited about the new Mind Over Finger book club, which is starting this January in the Facebook tribe. We're going to cover The Inner Game of Golf by Tim Galway. So if you're wondering about how you can perform more easily and at a higher level, this is the book for you. You might remember that Nathan Cole talked about how it changed things for him in episode seven. So we're going to read it and study it and apply it in our practice. So get the book and join the tribe at facebook.com slash groups slash mind over finger tribe. And let's get in the flow together. And because I like to make things as easy as possible for you guys, I will, of course, have all these links in the show notes. And if you're looking for a gift for yourself or for the favorite musician in your life, head over to my resource page at mindoverfinger.com slash resources. I've put together for you all of my favorite tools and CDs and books and recording equipment, as well as the books recommended by my guests here on the podcast. So it's a perfect musician's gift guide for the holidays. Once again, that's at mindoverfinger.com slash resources. And this is the last episode before the Christmas break. I'll miss you guys. And I send you my very best wishes for a fantastic holiday season and an incredible 2020. I'll be back on January 17th with a great lineup of guests coming up for winter 2020. And in the meantime, I'll see you on Facebook and Instagram. Again, thank you and à bientôt.